Hello, and welcome to our 2019 review. 2019 was another exciting year and a long string of good years for astronomy discoveries. This past year, we had a comet pass through from another solar system. We had a good look at the Southern Crab Nebula, which can only be seen in the Southern Hemisphere. We'll examine the space between two colliding galaxies. We'll see a galaxy that's losing all of its gas. We'll see a ring galaxy, very rare, and we'll talk about how they're formed. We'll see a new galaxy discovered accidentally by the Hubble Space Telescope as it was looking for something else. And we'll see one of the largest gamma ray bursts in history. And we'll see a galaxy that shows in the sky as an arc, a series of arcs. But the biggest news in 2019 was the release of an image of a black hole by the Event Horizon Telescope team. We'll do a deep dive into that image, what it shows, how they got it, and the implications for taking radio waves and turning them into images, and the implications for the general theory of relativity. In the credits, I want to bring your attention to a new book that's been made available on astronomy that's available online for free. I used it. And thanks to Jonathan Onstead, we have a new wiki. How far away is it wiki? Where we can discuss what's in this video or any video on the How Far Away Is It channel. I trust that you'll find it informative and interesting. We'll start close to home with the new comet. On August 30th, 2019, amateur astronomer Gennady Borisov discovered a new comet, now named after him. We covered comets in our How Far Away Is It segment on comets and the heliosphere, where we pointed out that there are two sources for comets in our solar system, the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. These two sources rotate in the solar system plane, as do the comets they produce. But this comet has entered in the inner solar system from a very steep angle. This has led astronomers to conclude that it is from another solar system. The comet made its closest approach to the Sun on December 7th. It's traveling at over 155,000 kilometers per hour. That's over 96,000 miles per hour. It's following a hyperbolic path, and by the middle of 2020, it will be on its way back into interstellar space. Hubble photographed the comet in October at a distance of approximately 420 million kilometers from Earth. That's 260 million miles. Its tail marks it as cometary. Its nucleus has a radius of about one kilometer, or six-tenths of a mile, a common size for solar system comets. The nucleus is dominated by dust with traces of gas, like our solar system comets. And the material it ejects travels at speeds similar to ejecta from solar system comets, suggesting a similar process. All in all, it appears remarkably similar to solar system comets, even though it formed in a distant star system. This nebula, nicknamed the Southern Crab, is located in the Southern Hemisphere, 7,000 light years from Earth. It has two stars at the center, an aging red giant star and a white dwarf. The red giant is shedding its outer layers. Some of this ejected material is attracted by the gravity of the companion white dwarf. The result is that both stars are embedded in a flat disk of gas stretching between them. This belt of material constricts the flow of gas so that it only speeds away above and below the disk. The result is an hourglass-shaped nebula. The bubbles of gas and dust appear brighter at the edges, giving an illusion of a crab-leg structure. 
These legs are likely to be the places where the outflow slams into surrounding interstellar gas and dust, or possibly material that was lost earlier by the red giant star. The outflow may only last a few thousand years, a tiny fraction of the lifetime of the system. This means that the outer structures may be just thousands of years old, but the inner hourglass must be much more recent than that. The red giant will ultimately collapse to become a white dwarf. After that, the surviving pair of white dwarfs will illuminate a shell of gas we know as a planetary nebula. In 2019, I released the How Old Are Stars video, where we covered HR diagram turnoff points to find the age of star clusters. Here's NGC 1466, a very old globular cluster in the Large Magellanic Cloud, 160,000 light-years away. It has a mass equivalent to roughly 140,000 suns, and a turnoff point that indicates its age as around 13.1 billion years, making it almost as old as the universe itself. All high-mass blue stars would have moved into their giant and supergiant phases by now. But we do see blue stars in this and many other clusters of similar age. These massive hot blue stars are a special type of reinvigorated stars called blue stragglers. Under certain circumstances, stars receive extra fuel that builds them up and subsequently brightens them. This can happen if one star pulls matter from a neighbor, or if two stars collide. Blue stragglers are so called because of their blue color and the fact that their evolution lags behind that of the rest of the stars in the cluster. Here's an interesting image released in 2019. It's a mosaic of sky photographs taken by the Pan Stars Observatory, a 1.8 meter telescope located at the summit of Haleakala on Maui. The center of the circle is the North Central Pole, and the outer edge is a sky declination of 30 degrees, which is where the Pan Star Survey stopped because it reached the southern horizon, as seen in Hawaii. The bright band extending from the top to bottom is our Milky Way galaxy. The center of the galaxy is near the bottom edge of the image where the galaxy is brightest. This Pan Star data is being used to produce the best map of our galaxy's dust. The irregular galaxy NGC 4485 shows the signs of having been involved in a collision with another galaxy. The right side of the galaxy is ablaze with star formation, shown in the large number of young blue and pinkish star birth nebulas. The left side, however, looks intact. It contains hints of the galaxy's previous spiral structure, which, at one time, was undergoing normal galactic evolution. Here's the other colliding galaxy, NGC 4490. The two galaxies sideswiped each other millions of years ago and are now 24,000 light years apart. The gravitational tug-of-war between them created rippling patches of high-density gas and dust within both galaxies. An international team of astronomers recently used the Hubble Space Telescope to study white dwarf stars within the globular cluster NGC 6752. In the outer fringes of the observed area, they accidentally discovered a compact collection of stars that were much further away than any of the stars in the cluster. In fact, they were so far away that they could not be in the Milky Way at all. Astronomers determined that they had found a new galaxy, a dwarf spheroidal galaxy 30 million light years away. They named it Bedden 1. Located about 30 million light years away, ESO 495-21 also known as Heinz 210, is a dwarf starburst galaxy around 3,000 light years in diameter 
containing just 3% of the mass of the Milky Way. In 2011, a radio wave source was pinpointed that corresponded to an earlier X-ray source at the same location. The balance of radiation levels in these different wavelengths pointed to the presence of a giant black hole accreting material from its surroundings. Based on these findings, the supermassive black hole is around one million solar masses. That's a quarter of the size of the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star at the center of our galaxy. The origin of the central supermassive black holes in galaxies is still a matter of debate. Do galaxies form first and then crash material at their centers into black holes? Or do pre-existing black holes gather galaxies around them? Or do they evolve together? Or could the answer be something else entirely? With its small size, indistinct shape, and rapid starburst activity, astronomers think this galaxy may be an analog for some of the first galaxies to have formed in the cosmos. Finding a black hole at this galaxy's center is a strong indication that black holes formed first, with galaxies developing later and evolving around them. New images from Hubble show D100 a spiral galaxy being stripped of its gas as it plunges towards the cluster's center. A long, thin stream of gas and dust stretches from the galaxy's core and on into space. The tail, a mixture of dust and hydrogen gas, extends nearly 200,000 light years. But the pencil-like structure is comparatively narrow, only 7,000 light years wide. Eventually, the galaxy will lose all of its gas. Without the material to create new stars, star formation in the galaxy will cease. The process is called ram pressure stripping. It occurs when a galaxy, due to the pull of gravity, falls towards the dense center of a massive cluster of thousands of galaxies. During its plunge, the galaxy plows through intergalactic material. The material pushes gas and dust from the galaxy. It is estimated that the gas stripping process in D100 began roughly 300 million years ago. Adding to this story is another galaxy in the image that foreshadows D100's fate. The object, named D99, began as a spiral galaxy similar in mass to D100. It underwent the same violent gas loss process as D100 is now undergoing, and it can no longer form new stars. Here we are zooming into a rare ring galaxy, 704 million light years away. Only a few hundred ring galaxies reside in our local supercluster. These kinds of galaxies are formed when two galaxies of the same size collide at just the right orientation to pull and stretch their disks of gas, dust, and stars outward to form the ring of intense star formation. The fact that the two central bulges are the same size tells us that the colliding galaxies were themselves the same size. In January 2019, an extremely bright and long-duration gamma-ray burst named GRB 1901-14C was detected by a suite of telescopes. This Hubble image, taken a few weeks later, caught the fading afterglow of the event in the center of the green circle. The short-lived afterglow was located 4.5 billion light years away and almost 800 light years from the galaxy's core. This gamma ray burst was one of the most powerful ever recorded. In just a few seconds, it emitted more energy than the sun will produce over its entire 10 billion year lifespan. Astrophysicists calculate that to acquire this much energy, matter has to be emitted from a collapsing star at 99.999% of the speed of light. Then as the star's material is forced through the gas that surrounds the star, a shock creates the gamma ray burst. This is an artist's depiction of what this might look like. 
This Hubble image shows a massive galaxy cluster about 4.6 billion light years away. Along its border, four bright arcs are visible. These are copies of the same distant galaxy, nicknamed the Sunburst Arc. It's almost 11 billion light years away. Its light is being lensed into multiple images by strong gravitational lensing. The Sunburst Arc is among the brightest lensed galaxies known, and its image is visible at least 12 times within the four arcs. Here's a closer look at three of them. The lens makes various images from 10 to 30 times brighter. This allows Hubble to view structures as small as 520 light years across, a rare detailed observation for an object that far away. Astronomers developed a mosaic of the distant universe from nearly 7,500 individual exposures, called the Hubble Legacy Field. It documents 16 years of observations from NASA ESA Hubble Space Telescope. This image contains 200,000 galaxies that stretch back through 13.3 billion years to just 500 million years after the Big Bang. Here we are zooming into M87, the dominant galaxy at the center of the Virgo galaxy cluster. It's a huge elliptical galaxy that contains several trillion stars. The steady increase in brightness of M87 towards its center is readily apparent in the image, showing that the stars in M87 are strongly concentrated towards its nucleus. Note the jet of material streaming out from the center. This indicates that the galaxy has an active galactic nucleus, AGN for short. That is, it has a supermassive black hole at its center that is accumulating large amounts of matter from an accretion disk. In 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope released an image of this black hole, the first ever image of a black hole. We'll cover this black hole and its image in a bit. But first, we'll take a deeper look at this jet. It provides information on our line of sight orientation and explains some of the physics needed to fully understand the black hole's image. We've known about the jet of plasma shooting out from the core of M87 since 1918, when astronomer Herbert Curtis saw a ray of light connected to the galaxy center, 5,000 light years long and two light years wide. Several things stand out about this jet. It's blue. It's very bright. It consists of chunks or knots, and it terminates in a plume. You may have also noted that there is no counter jet going out the other way, like we've seen in other galaxies. The jet is understood to have been formed in a strong magnetic field created by the interaction between a spinning black hole and the rotating accretion disk. Then, at the point where matter from the accretion disk is crossing the event horizon into the black hole, a small percentage of the charged particles are swept into this magnetic field and ejected into the jet at the black hole's escape velocity, which is near the speed of light for objects as massive as a black hole. These escaping particles are forced into circular orbits around the strong magnetic field. These circularly accelerating ions create electromagnetic radiation across a wide spectrum, including radio, visible, and X-ray light. This is what we are seeing with our radio, optical, and X-ray telescopes. It's called synchrotron radiation, and it's well understood because it's the same as the radiation from synchrotron particle accelerators we build here on Earth. The two key jet features we observe directly are its apparent luminosity and its apparent motion across the sky. 
A study done by a team of astronomers using the European Very Long Baseline Interferometer Radio Telescope Network analyzed the motion of one of the knots near the jet's origin at the black hole. They found that one of the components moved 30 milliarc seconds over two years. That's a very tiny amount, but when you multiply it by the large distance to M87, we find that the distance traveled was eight light years. To travel eight light years in just two years means its velocity is four times the speed of light. We call the apparent velocities greater than the speed of light superluminal motion. Here's how it works. Suppose we have an object at location A at time t1 that moves to location B at time t2, the travel time being delta t. d is the distance traveled. It will equal the object's velocity times its travel time. We're observing this motion from a great distance at an angle theta from the object's line of motion. We see only the proper or transverse motion across the sky, designated here as d prime. Our start time is the object's start time plus the time it takes the light to get from point A to point O, where we are. Our end time is the object's end time plus the time it takes the light to get from point B to point O. With that, we can calculate the observer's view of the object's velocity in terms of the object's view and vice versa. If we plug in the numbers we found for knot C in the M87 jet, we find that the apparent velocity of four times the speed of light turns out to be 0.97 times the speed of light in the object's frame of reference. And the apparent elapsed time of two years turns out to have taken the object almost 67 years. It was not traveling faster than the speed of light. Note that this only happens when the velocity of the object is near the speed of light, and in addition, the viewing angle is small. Another relativistic effect at play here is called relativistic beaming. To illustrate, consider an inertial reference frame moving to the right at relativistic speeds with respect to an aligned reference frame on the right. A particle emits a photon at an angle alpha from the line of motion. The angle measured in the frame on the right can be computed using the Lorentz transformation. Using M87C1's velocity as the velocity and 60 degrees as a sample angle, we see that the observed angle alpha prime is considerably smaller at only 8.2 degrees. A synchrotron radiating electron moving at speeds far smaller than the speed of light will emit radiation in all directions. Distant observers would see just the portion of the light radiated in their direction. As the speed of the electron increases, these light rays shift in the direction of the emitting object's motion. As the velocity of the emitting particle approaches the speed of light, the observed angle approaches zero. The light is beamed ahead of the emitter in the direction of the emitter's movement. This is the case no matter what the emitted angle is in its own frame of reference. For trillions of continually emitting particles, like the electrons in the M87 jet, this beaming effect increases the photon density in the direction of the movement, causing the jet's luminosity to increase. This explains why the jet looks so bright. And because the jet moving in the opposite direction will have their photons beamed away from the observer, the jet becomes invisible. This explains why we see only one jet in M87. Our last relevant effect is called relativistic Doppler shift. Due to space contraction, when we apply the Lorentz transformation against the frequency of a photon emitted in the same fashion as we just covered, we find that the frequency observed is greater than the frequency transmitted. This explains why the M87 jet is so blue. 
In 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope, EHT for short, released an image of the supermassive black hole at the center of M87 that created and powers the M87 jets. This image represents the first direct visual evidence for a black hole. Basically, we're looking at an emission ring around a dark shadow. This is consistent with the idea that the ring is gravitationally lensed light produced by a hot, turbulent, magnetized accretion disk orbiting close to the event horizon of a Kerr black hole, and the dark center is the black hole's shadow. We covered Kerr black holes in the 2019 release of the How Far Away Is It chapter on the Milky Way as part of our close look at Sag A star, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. The light recorded was radio light, 1.3 millimeters, which we cannot see with optical telescopes. To create this image, the EHT team chose to display the measured radio light intensity in units of brightness temperature, with orange signifying low intensity radio light, yellow signifying more intense radio light, and black signifying very little or no radio light. Four images were created from four different days in April 2017. They show movement with stability in the basic image structure. The movement indicates a clockwise rotation in the disk, but there is insufficient information to determine the disk's velocity. Note that the emission ring is brighter on the south side. If we were observing from directly above, the accretion disk would be moving perpendicular to our line of sight. No parts would be moving towards or away from us. We would expect the luminosity to be the same across the entire disk. But from our M87 jet analysis, we found that we are viewing from around a 14 degree angle to the west. This orients the ring in such a way that the matter rotating in the southern half of the ring is moving closer to us, and matter rotating in the northern half of the ring is moving further away from us. It is thought that the southern portion is brighter due to the relativistic beaming effect we covered earlier. This would in turn imply that the disk's plasma is rotating at speeds that are a significant percentage of the speed of light. Here's the measured distance from the center of the black hole to the inner rim of the emission ring. This is the innermost stable circular orbit radius. It's also the photon sphere, where photons can get trapped into an orbit around the black hole. With this radius, we can calculate the black hole's mass. Sag A star has the mass of 4 million suns. M87's black hole is 1,600 times more massive than that, with 6.5 billion suns. This is in close agreement with star rotation studies that put the mass at 6.2 billion suns. Modeling the disk as a rotating charged plasma in a strong and twisted magnetic field under general relativistic conditions, astrophysicists have determined that the spin of the black hole is aligned with the rotation. But again, there is not enough information to determine its spin. For our illustrative purposes, we'll assume that it's 0.9. With that, we calculate the event horizon. It's over 63 times further away from its center than we are from the Sun. Unless it accretes additional energy, Matter that crosses this innermost stable circular orbit threshold will enter into a decaying orbit into the event horizon. But we know that the powerful magnetic field near the horizon is capable of accelerating charged particles to near the speed of light and ejecting them at escape velocity in jets perpendicular to the rotating disk. In addition, most photon trajectories into this region will also result in their eventually entering the black hole. This marks the extent of the black hole's shadow. Black hole shadows were expected to be significantly larger than the black hole itself. 
This one is triple the size of our entire solar system. Here we have traced the peak of the emissions in the ring in order to determine the shape of the image and to obtain the ratio between major and minor axes of the ring. It's 4 to 3. With our 14 degree tilt, this corresponds to a true circle, give or take 10%. This is what the general relativity theory predicts for co-rotating black holes. And here we have the full size of the black hole and its emission ring. It's 10 times further out than Voyager 1 has traveled since its launch in 1977. The diameter of the M87 black hole emission ring, 54.8 million light years away, is 43 millionths of an arc second. The resolving power of a telescope is the smallest angular distance between two objects that can be seen as separate objects. A telescope's resolving power is limited by its baseline, the diameter of its lens. The 2.4 meter Hubble Space Telescope has the resolving power to see down close to 50 milli arc seconds. The M87 black hole is over a thousand times too small for Hubble to see. The 120 meter ESO VLTI used to study SAG-A star has the resolving power to see down to one milli arc second. The M87 black hole is almost 22 times too small for ESO VLTI to see. To get down to the micro arc second level, a much bigger telescope is needed. In order to get a telescope baseline large enough, the EHT team upgraded and connected a worldwide network of eight pre-existing radio telescopes deployed at a variety of high-altitude sites. These locations included volcanoes in Hawaii and Mexico, mountains in Arizona, Spain, and Chile, and one in Antarctica. Baseline lengths between telescopes vary, but the resulting effective combined baseline is close to the diameter of the Earth. This results in an array with a resolution limit of around 21 microarc seconds. This is enough to see the M87 black hole's emission ring with its shadow. Although the telescopes are not physically connected, they are able to synchronize their recorded data with atomic clocks which precisely time their observations. Each telescope produced roughly 350 terabytes of data Per day. This data was stored on high-performance hard drives and flown to highly specialized supercomputers at the MIT Haystack Observatory and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy, where the data was combined. In science, the inverse problem is the process of calculating from a set of observables back to the causal factors that produced them. It is always a challenge to figure out what was actually happening at the source of the collected data. For example, the ESO VLT interferometer team reconstructed the motion of S2 around SAG A star in the UV plane 26,000 light years away by applying interferometry techniques to images captured by the telescope in the observation plane here on Earth. The EHT directly measured the radio brightness distribution on the sky called visibilities. The inverse problem is to calculate what caused this distribution and produce an image. Radio data is normally quite dirty. One of the primary radio astronomy interferometry techniques is a cleaning algorithm called CLEAN. It can take this dirty image and do this. However, there were two challenging issues with the EHT data. First, samples were limited to only a few hours a day for four days. Because the source plane is only sparsely sampled, the inverse problem is under constrained. That is, the number of potential causes that can lead to these visibilities expands dramatically. And second, 
the measured visibilities had large amplitude calibration uncertainties. To address these challenges, a new imaging algorithm was developed that incorporated additional assumptions and constraints designed to produce images that are physically plausible while remaining consistent with the data. The algorithm is called Regularized Maximum Likelihood, RML for short. It searches for an image that is not only consistent with the observed data, but also favors specific image properties like smoothness and compactness. A library of tens of thousands of images was created with different parameter combinations associated with general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. Using both clean and RMT on the visibilities, this image was developed. It supports Einstein's general theory of relativity in part because it assumed general relativity in order to get the image. The visibilities could have been explained by some other theory, but without relativity, they just produced static. Here are the links to Hubble sites, white papers, and other locations where I found the information contained in this 2019 review. These are also the places where you can go to begin your own research. Also, thanks to Jonathan Onsted, there is a How Far Away Is It wiki available for anyone who wants to engage in conversations about this or any channel video. I want to call your attention to a new free online textbook called Astronomy that anyone interested in astronomy can use. It is supported by the OpenStax, a Rice University 501c3 nonprofit charity. The book builds student understanding through the use of relevant analogies, clear and non-technical explanations, and rich illustrations. I used it. Take a look at synchrotron radiation on page 972. And don't forget, every video as a document on the HowFarAwayIsIt.com website containing all the text. Download and translate as needed. Thanks for watching.